Okay, great. Um, all right. Uh, well, everyone, thank you so much for, for coming today. Um, this is our first uh, public debate of the Rikers debate uh, season, so um, for, for 2021. Um, so we're really excited. And um, I'm just going to quickly, so my name is Josh Morrison. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Rikers Debate uh, and also the director of public events um, for the, the organization. And so um, this event is actually part of a series um, uh, what we call the, the George Floyd protest debate series that we started um, after um, George Floyd's death and the, the protests to um, talk about issues of criminal justice um, and race in America. And so um, we did several debates last year on the topic of defunding the police and also debates on defunding the Department of Correction and on um, giving people in prison the right to vote. And the first couple of debates of this year, um, there's this debate and the debate coming up in two weeks at Johns Hopkins are going to be about um, health uh, in the context of people who are incarcerated. And so tonight's topic is whether people who are incarcerated should be able to participate in phase three vaccine studies during a pandemic. And we're really excited about this debate um, because you know we, we came up with the idea for, for this topic after reading a, a really interesting piece in the New England Journal of Medicine that was put together um, by the, the National Institute of Health's bioethics team. And um, we reached out to the first author of that piece, Camilla Strausel, that you'll hear from soon. And um, we also have the senior author of that piece, Holly uh, Taylor, who's gonna be one of the judges for the debate as well. Um, so we thought that this, you know, kind of bringing the perspective of people who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated uh, to this question is something Rikers Debate's really well suited to do. Um, so what I'll do, I, I kind of wear two hats um, with both Rikers Debate and a co-sponsoring organization one day sooner. I'll do a quick intro of those. Um, and then I will turn it over um, to um, the Stanford Debate Society to talk a little bit about, about them because they're the other group working on this debate. And then um, we'll introduce the judges and debaters, talk a little bit of the format, um, and then turn it over to Camilla Strazel to, to give an introduction to the topic. Uh, and then we'll have uh, the debate. Um, so first, you know, quickly just talking about um, leaving the Rikers debate piece aside for, for a second, um, One Day Sooner um, is a group um, that I'm one of the founders of that exists to, to represent research participants, particularly people who are interested in COVID-19 human challenge studies. Um, we're interested in bioethics more broadly and particularly in um, uh, trying to empower uh, and deal, you know, people of color and deal with some of the questions of racial injustice um, that have plagued medical testing in, in some contexts. And so we thought this would be a really good event to, to co-sponsor and, and kind of help um, help publicize this, this issue. And I'm sure some of the attendees here um, are from the kind of One Day Sooner community. Um, Rikers Debate uh, is a group that was founded five years ago um, after a, a debate um, at, held at, at Rikers. Um, and the, the goal of Rikers Debate is to give people a say, people who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated, a say in the decisions that affect their lives uh, by teaching the, the skills of debate and connecting them to the community of, of debaters, many of whom tend to be uh, more, more privileged and have kind of more power, political power than our numbers merit, um, to try to unify that community with people who are debaters who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated and have less uh, power than their numbers merit. And, um, you know, during COVID has obviously been, been quite a challenge for our organization because we're a group that's, that's primary activities have been around teaching uh, in jails and prisons. We teach in about, we're an all volunteer program. Uh, we teach in uh, about 10, we, we, before the pandemic taught in about 10 classes each week um, in, in 10 different facilities in five different states. Um, since the pandemic, we've uh, moved into a correspondence course model and have been doing these public events over Zoom um, and doing some advocacy activities around um, trying to highlight the voices of our incarcerated students. And some of those, those kind of perspectives from people who are incarcerated during COVID have been uh, published in the Houston Chronicle um, by ProPublica and in, in the Appeal. So we're really excited to be that, that kind of um, voice uh, of, of folks who are incarcerated. Um, okay, so with that, I will um, turn it over to um, the Stanford Debate team to tell us a little bit uh, about the Stanford Debate Society, um, and then we'll um, do some introductions of judges and debaters and talk a little bit about the format. All right, cool. Um, thank you, Josh, and thank you, everybody who has organized this event. Uh, we're definitely very appreciative and are super honored to have this opportunity um, to work with Rikers Debate. 
So Stanford Debate Society is a non-politically affiliated organization on campus. Our members are really diverse. We come from um, all different kinds of majors, different kinds of interests, but we do share a common passion for debate, dialogue, um, and basically the club empowers its members to go and compete in a variety of tournaments uh, in different formats, um, not only in America, but also across the world. And yeah, so our uh, main thing is doing competitive debating, but also we host a bunch of um, events on campus. We've held public debates with various other student organizations like Stanford um, Ethics and also Stanford, um, you know, doing debates with uh, political organizations too. Great. Um, and so um, first, you know, we'll do the judging introductions um, just as I'll actually call on each of the judges and have them introduce themselves briefly, um, just a bit about their professional background, any kind of past involvement with debate, uh, maybe where they're, they're calling in from. Um, and then we'll introduce our debaters, um, talk a little bit about the format, and then flip the a coin to actually let the debaters choose which side they're going to be on. Um, so first, um, uh, Harry Elliott, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi. Uh, good. Good evening. My name's Harry. Uh, several. Sorry, I'm pictured with my little beast because she wasn't being quiet when she was on the ground. Uh, so apologies for that. Uh, I uh, debated for Stanford between 2014 and 2018, um, and and attended some tournaments. Uh, I suppose back in the day. Uh, since then, I've judged uh, a number of tournaments, including uh, the North American Championships a couple of years ago. Um, although I haven't done much during COVID. Um, for obvious reasons, uh, very happy to be here um, and to represent the SDS community as well as the broader debate community. Great, thanks. Uh, Kate Falkenstein. Hi, I'm Kate. Uh, I'm dialing in from Boise. Uh, I guess I'm here for my sort of debate background too. I actually used to be Harry's debate coach on the Stanford team when I was in law school. Um, and, and debated a bunch myself in college. Um, now I'm a lawyer, I'm mostly a patent lawyer, but I actually also do a significant amount of pro bono work representing inmates in lawsuits about um, prison conditions and sleep deprivation in prison. So I'm particularly excited about this topic. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Uh, Lily? Sure, um, I'm dialing in from the side of the road in South Robles. <laughs> I'm on a road trip right now and thought I'd be at my hotel. We are not. We got an electric car, uh, which is great. But I um, I was a college debater for uh, Smith College and Amherst College during college, and then worked with the Stanford debate team while I was a graduate student there, uh, where I actually worked with Rob Rich, who's one of the other debaters here. Um, and he was my advisor when I was there. I got the ACA for the philosophy from Stanford, and I am now part of a new role as the diversity equity and inclusion director for the field of health, which is overseeing the vaccine rollout. So I was particularly excited um, to hear. Uh, awesome, thank you. Um, and Chris Lewis? Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Chris Lewis. Uh, I teach at Harvard Law School. I, I teach criminal law, um, legal philosophy, and uh, write about moral questions about how criminal law and policy should be, and uh, more generally how public policy should be in light of the things we know about uh, social economic inequality. Um, I've never actually even been to a debate per se in my life, but um, I guess all of my work is kind of like debate. So I'm looking forward to seeing how, how this goes. Great. Um, uh, Rob? Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Rob Reich. I'm a professor in the political science department at Stanford, and I'm also the current faculty director of the Center for Ethics and Society at Stanford, where uh, Camilla was a star undergraduate um, honor student, and in the political science department where Lily was a star PhD student. Um, like Chris, uh, I have exactly zero experience with debate. I was never a debater, and I don't think I've ever even attended a debate. So this is my first one and um, uh, I can't wait to experience it. I'm excited. Awesome. Um, uh, Jenny Savage. Hey everyone, I'm Jenny Savage. I'm the director of speech and debate at Palo Alto High School and a former high school debate champ myself and also a former senior legislative aide in the US House of Representatives um, who worked on the 94 crime bill. And I'm really, really 
excited to be here and to hear from the experts on this. Great. Um, and then Holly Taylor is the last of our judges. Hi, everyone. I'm Holly. I am a research bioethicist in the Department of Bioethics at the National Institutes of Health. I'm calling in from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, I did graduate from Stanford in 87, so I have a, a small link <laughs> to the West Coasters. And I spend my time mostly, I'm a social scientist by training and spend most of my time thinking about research ethics and specifically the local implementation of uh, federal policy as it relates to human subject research. So um, I too am brand new to debate, but um, as Rob mentioned, I do spend a lot of time thinking carefully about arguments and justifications. So hopefully that will come in handy. <laughs> okay, great. Um... And so actually before I um, introduce the debaters, um, let me first uh, do the coin flip for, for sides um, and then I'll introduce the debaters and I'll, I'll just say, tell the audience a little bit um, about the, uh, the format for the round. Um, so which of our debaters wants to call the, uh, the coin flip? And she of for our team. All right. Uh, and Shia, what, what are you, what is your, what are you, um, what's your prediction for the coin? Uh, heads. All right, it is, I don't know if you can see it here, but it is uh, heads. Um, which side do you want? Oh, we get to pick the side if we get it correct. Yeah, what, what, what else? I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> okay. Another thing you can do with coin. Oh, hmm. uh, Louis, how about, which, which side do you, would you prefer? Which you feel best about? Uh, uh, let's. I think we should uh, take. Ah. Sure, I guess we'll do opposition. Uh, all right. Um, so, uh, so then to do um, introductions. Um, the uh, so the government team, which means the team that is in favor uh, of this of the resolutions, so the team in favor of um, making people in prison able to test, um, able to participate in uh, phase three vaccine studies during a, a pandemic, um, is Camilla Broderick um, and uh, Guyun Kim. Um, and Camilla is one of the um, uh, well, actually, Camilla is our first uh, Rikers Debate Fellow. She was a captain um, of our team um, in her class at the Rose M. Singer Center at, at Rikers Island. And uh, she has um, published opinion pieces uh, in places like City and State uh, and has appeared on shows like um, Samantha B and uh, the New Yorker Radio Hour. Um, and Guyun, her, and she's gonna be the first speaker of the round. Uh, and her partner, Guyun, is a debater at Stanford. I should have asked you for more of a bio before. Um, on the opposition side, uh, we have Lewis Conway, um, who's another one of our uh, former Rikers Debate Fellows uh, and is a campaign strategist at the ACLU and his Stanford um, debater counterpart, uh, Nchia Lee. Um, so for the round, uh, before I turn it over to Camilla Strazel to kind of introduce the topic, um, for the round, it'll be uh, a total of six speeches. Um, the first four speeches are what are called constructives, where people can make new arguments. And the last two speeches um, were the, will be um, uh, what are called rebuttals, where they're recapping the arguments in the round and not making new arguments, but explaining why their side won the round. Um, after that, there'll be a, um, the judge, there'll be a panel while the judges go out and deliberate amongst themselves. Um, and then the audience will have an opportunity to submit questions um, for the debaters who are on the panel. Um, and then um, after that, the judges will come back in and give their, um, uh, give their reasons for decision and vote on the uh, debate. Um, 
so with that, um, oh, sorry, one, one final thing. Um, so we keep uh, strictly to, to time uh, for the different speeches um, with, a, with a grace period. So there's a 30 second grace period um, and we will warn the debaters when their grace period is coming up and when their grace period is over, we will mute them. Um, so that's just one thing to know for the, the debaters ahead of time. Um, I think with that, unless I'm missing anything, which hopefully um, someone could, could yell at me in the chat if I am, um, I'll turn over to Camilla Strazel to, to talk about the, the topic in general, and then we'll start the debate round um, after she gives that introduction. Um, so um, uh, Camilla, um, I'll have you go, um, go ahead. Okay. Um, so as many of you know, incarcerated people are a vulnerable population when it comes to research. You might be on mute, I can't hear you. Can you not hear me? Still? I you can, can hear you. Can hear you. Okay, great. Maybe um, fine. All right. Well, uh, the status of being incarcerated makes possible the perpetration of certain systemic injustices. Well, I don't think we can hear you. We can all hear her, Josh. I just hope yeah. you can hear her. Okay. I'll just uh, continue in the assumption that everyone can hear me. <laughs> um, so one of the central principles of bioethics is respect for persons. Respect for persons represents the idea that we should respect people's autonomy, but also protect them from abuse. On the one hand, it would seem that the principle of respect for persons requires that incarcerated people not be deprived of the opportunity to, uh, to volunteer for research. An outright ban on research in prisons would lead to the concern that researchers are understudying medical conditions that disproportionately affect incarcerated people as a class. And there is widespread belief in the United States that individuals with life-threatening conditions have a right to choose to receive experimental treatments that could benefit their health when there aren't therapeutic alternatives. On the other hand, under prison conditions, incarcerated people may be subtly coerced or unduly influenced to engage in research activities for which they would not otherwise volunteer. And in this context, respect for persons would dictate that incarcerated people be protected. In particular, we may be worried about researchers encouraging incarcerated people to take on research risks solely for administrative convenience when the incarcerated people themselves are unlikely to enjoy the benefits from any of the generalizable knowledge that will result from the research itself. So whether to allow incarcerated people to volunteer for research or to protect them from exploitation from research presents an ethical dilemma. The question that we have before us is whether incarcerated people should be included among those eligible to enroll in vaccine efficacy trials after safety trials are complete during a global pandemic. Incarcerated people are far more likely than the general population to get sick and die from infectious diseases like COVID-19. And in this context, incarcerated people may want access to infectious disease research. But research involving incarcerated people is complex. So name just a few issues. Benefits from research are never guaranteed. Incarcerated people have limited access to on-site clinical resources if they become symptomatic or develop complications while enrolled. Incarcerated people may fear reporting symptoms to authorities because of consequences like placement and segregation. And it can be difficult to ensure adequate consent processes in this environment. So I think this is an area that deserves more attention and I'm looking forward to um, tonight's discussion. All right, thanks. Um, and sorry to have uh, Wi-Fi uh, issues. So with that, um, I call this has to order and call on the Honorable Prime Minister, Clint Miller Broderick, to deliver the first constructive speech of the round, not to exceed uh, three minutes. You're here. Thanks. Uh, this House proposes that during any foreseeable pandemic, individuals in prison should be able to enroll in vaccine studies. For a first point, allowing prisoners to participate in vaccine trials could provide early access to a vaccine and give us insight into the efficacy of the vaccine with regards to transmission rates. Prisons and jails are a highly communicative environment where pandemics can spread like wildfire, which makes prisons the perfect test environment for contagious disease trials. According to the Marshall Project, one in five prisoners has tested positive for the virus, which is four times the rate of the general population. Conditions inside prison are prone to spreading disease. 
They're overcrowded, confined spaces with high turnover rates in poorly ventilated buildings. This is an at-risk population that could be greatly helped by being able to enroll in vaccine studies. And by offering prisoners the ability to enroll in the trial, we have the potential to combat some of these factors. If the vaccine trial is effective at present preventing the spread of the contagious virus, prisoners who opted into the trial will now have been given early access to an effective vaccine, and researchers can study transmission rates in a high turnover environment. As well, by including incarcerated individuals in clinical trials, it will be mandatory that prisons and jails be guaranteed universal access to the vaccine once proven successful. Despite being an at-risk population, most states haven't prioritized immunizing their prisoners. However, by being included in a clinical trial, this would be mandatory that they be prioritized. We would also see basic environmental changes that would benefit prisoners, such as ventilation systems, sanitation, and better access to health care. This will benefit prisoners in the long run and researchers studying the virus. For our second point, we have to weigh the ethical considerations of a trial like this and the opinions of those incarcerated. For an ethical study, a vaccine trial would be voluntary and couldn't result in any special treatment or conditions. For example, offering someone early release or special privileges for participating. There would need to be an oversight from the Federal Oversight Board and an Institutional Review Board. And incarcerated individuals agree. A 2016 study showed that 98% of prisoners agreed they should be allowed to participate in research if they want to. 95% said they should have the chance to join more research studies if they want to. If incarcerated individuals are informed and willing to participate participate in research studies, why is their consent any less meaningful than a non-incarcerated person's? As long as there's a process, process of informed consent and voluntary enrollment, along with oversight from review boards, there's an ethical foundation for a vaccine trial inside prison. Moreover, it will be unethical to not provide this care to an at-risk population or to not accept a prisoner's autonomy in their decision-making process. And for these reasons, we propose Thank you. You're here. Uh, the House thanks uh, Camilla Broderick and calls on the leader of opposition, uh, Lewis Conway. Thank you. And, and to our esteemed guests and my fellow speakers, I, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for allowing me to argue our position on during pandemic, should people in prison be able to enroll in vaccine studies? Uh, you know, she mentioned that one in every five state and federal prisoners in the United States has tested positive for the coronavirus, a rate that is four times higher than the general population. But what she failed to mention is 275,000 prisoners have been infected. And that means more than 1,700 have died. Now, these numbers do not include jails. Now, as the pandemic enters this 12th month, and as the first Americans begin to receive the long-awaited COVID-19 vaccines, I think it's important for us to underscore the fact that this isn't a challenge trial, an early stage trial, but a third phase of trials for vaccines that haven't been proven to be completely safe. And maybe most importantly, not even preventative. Recently, there have been calls for the responsible inclusion of incarcerated populations in this research as a means of expanding access to the potential benefits of participation, but at what cost? Uh, our first point in support of our position is allowing people in prison to participate in vaccine trials that will potentially expose them to a deadly disease is unethical, inhumane, and further preys on an already vulnerable population. You see, exposing them to this vaccine is dangerous. Even though this vaccine are in phase three trials, participants would still be exposed to a piece of the virus. Now their safety is not guaranteed. And in an environment where getting access to aspirin is a Herculean feat, exposing people in carceral conditions to a deadly and highly contagious virus is unconscionable. And as we know, during the vaccine trials, participants must be exposed to a deadly disease. You need them to be exposed to the disease. This guarantees that people who are already suffering from pre-existing conditions, even though it might be done willingly, according to the recent polls, as uh, Prime Minister indicated, it still means that these people are exposed to a disease that has killed over half a million people in America to date. And thoroughly to underscore this point, conditions in prison are already severely lacking and access to PPE 
cleaning materials and sanitizing options are severely limited, making it a compounded matrix of infection. Now, secondly, it would open up opportunities for, public, for people incarcerated to be used as human guinea pigs and also be offered gratuity for participation. Research involving incarcerated population is ethically, legally, and logistically complex. You know, before the 1970s, it was common for us to use folks incarcerated. Uh, but since then, in response, regulations have classified that people uh, who are incarcerated are a vulnerable population. And for purposes of medical research, it makes us difficult to um, walk that ethical tightrope. And within correctional facilities, there may be a real or perceived pressure from authorities to enroll in research. Uh, and, and I pose the question, what happens when those folks are offered vaccines in exchange for parole or exchange for extra commissary, exchange for extra access? And what happens more importantly if they refuse? And with that, uh, I'll close my argument. House thanks the leader of opposition and now calls on the member of government, Gayun Kim, uh, to deliver the second um, government speech of the round, not to exceed four minutes. Facts here are quite clear. The phase three trials of the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines that were based on mRNA technology demonstrated that these technologies have more than 95% efficacy in preventing moderate and severe cases of COVID-19. If the leader of opposition is to bring up evidence suggesting that disproportionate numbers of prisoners have been infected and died, but due to COVID-19 compared to the general population, we say that the solution is not to deny them highly effective preventative care, but rather to provide them an opportunity to participate in a trial to which they have the right. I'm going to spend most of my speech um, defending our case against that of side oppositions. They tell us that the statistics are overwhelmingly um, skewed against prisoners that over 275,000 individuals have been infected already. What we fail to notice here is a link between prisoners being infected and the, the trial being uh, allowed to commence um, in, the in, in the imprisoned population. They talk about safety being an issue, but we say that phase two trials are ultimately necessary and required to proceed to phase three. And this is something that is strictly regulated by the FDA and other governmental institutions, whatever the equivalent is in foreign countries. We say that phase two trials are primarily preserved for testing the safety of vaccines and the safety of other types of medication, and phase three is mostly to test the efficacy. So even if in the worst case scenario, the vaccine does not end up being as effective as we would hope, it is still definitely not a concern that this will be unsafe or that this will harm the prisoners in a way that the virus would not have already. Second, we tell you that the genetic material in most of the COVID vaccines that have been, or in fact, all of the COVID vaccines that have been developed thus far has been proven scientifically to not affect you or your own genetic material. The fact is that there have been zero phase three vaccines that have demonstrated safety problems, particularly in the form of actually infecting individuals with COVID. Receiving a COVID vaccine um, cannot give you COVID. And if that were the case, they wouldn't have passed through phase one and phase two studies. But if we are to actually argue a utilitarian stance, we would point to the potential health benefits, both to the public, but more importantly, to the incarcerated population of allowing them to participate in these trials. As Camilla talked about, we say that uh, most, most um, that a massive amount of spread could happen both among incarcerated individuals who live in confined spaces and who do not have the ability to, for instance, wear masks, wash hands at will, or socially distance from one another, but also given the fact that guards and visitors go in and out of these prisons, um, that this could also lead to community transmission outside of the, uh, the, the, the correctional facilities as well. So we say that if these vaccines are even remotely effective, let's say like anything above 50% effective in preventing severe cases of COVID or reducing transmission, we say that the risks are worth it. The second claim that they make is one related to ethics, where they say that this is ultimately treating indiv uh, incarcerated individuals as human guinea pigs. Notice that most of the examples that they bring up come from the 1970s, that, the, like the, that for instance, in the past, these clinical trials that have been allowed to um, uh, recruit prisoners have been abusive in nature. 
But notice that nowadays, most of the, uh, most of the internal review board procedures, as well as the um, policies and the federal regulations surrounding clinical trial enrollment, prevent these types of human rights abuses from occurring. That there are ways to ensure that doctors and nurses who administer this vaccine will have to provide fo a follow-up medical care, which we would argue is in fact a benefit in prisons, where um, as the leader of opposition admits, most people lack access to basic medical care. Or secondly, that, um, that most instances of, of coercing individuals to participate in trials that they simply don't want to participate in um, will not occur and will strictly be banned. Secondly, we tell you that there is really no reason why we think that prison, uh, that the prison guards, for instance, or anyone directly interfacing with the incarcerated population will have an incentive to force them to enroll in clinical trials. Because prison guards who, for instance, are the ones who commonly um, incite abuse upon prisoners have no vested interest or any personal interest in making, uh, in seeing these clinical trials through to success. So even if we agree with some of the monetary benefits or, or some, of the, um, some of the inherent risks of, of allowing individuals in person to have choice over certain matters, we say that the benefits of, uh, that the ethical benefits of allowing participation in clinical trials far outweigh the harms. In sum, we tell you that if we are to obey the respect for persons rule, um, it is only correct that we allow individuals who are at high risk and who are most vulnerable to participate in clinical trials as we allow for the rest of the population. Thank you. Here, here. Uh, the House thanks the member of government um, and now calls on uh, the member of opposition um, and Chia to deliver the final constructive speech of the round, not to exceed four minutes. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, again, before I start, again, thank you everybody for organizing this event. Really great to speak here. Before getting to argumentation, I want to set a really important frame for this debate. It is not only about COVID, it is about every kind of future pandemic that can possibly occur. We're talking about a generalizable case in which there can be risk, there can be stage three vaccine trials that are a lot riskier. But I would also like to note that COVID stage three vaccine trials still carry a great degree of risk for participants who choose to undergo it. This is why we have very intense review policies for people who are not incarcerated, who are perfectly healthy, well, uh, consenting adults to be able to know exactly what is going on before they opt into something that can put their physical health at risk. I want now to ex respond extraneously to two arguments we get from side government before talking about how this creates incentives for exploitation, not only in the present, but also far into the future. First, from Prime Minister, we get the idea that now it will be mandatory that these vulnerable populations will be prioritized in later trials. I like to know that this is simply an assertion. There is no reason we get as to why there's going to be the political will for there to be vaccines distributed to the test centers, given that a lot of the times incarcerated populations are widely stigmatized in broader society. We don't think this is necessarily a condition that will follow. The second thing I want to respond to is their argument on efficacy. They say we can get a better vaccine sooner that helps everybody. First, I'd like to note that there are many other locations throughout the US and throughout other countries that are also highly uh, that are also highly affected by such a process, meaning that it is not unique that we have to go into prisons, otherwise we can't get efficacious test sites. There are a lot of other uh, there are a lot of other locations we can opt for. But more importantly, it is principally incorrect to test these vaccines on such populations. Why is this the case? First, again, vaccines carry a high degree of risk, which means we need to have consent. But consent isn't po uh, possible in this case, because when you're put into a situation in which there's power asymmetry guarding your every single uh, movement, every part of your day, any authority that comes in that appears to be a lot more knowledgeable that proposes this vaccine trial will have a great degree of psychological influence over you, and therefore perfect consent cannot be achieved in this instance. But more importantly, it is incredibly dangerous, as Lewis tells you, to allow these individuals to bear the harms, mostly because because they lack the medical facilities to treat these individuals in case things go awry. When you're out, when you're like not, uh, when you're testing this on a non-incarcerated population, if you do start to feel the effects of COVID, you can easily access better medical facilities, which means the risk that you incur to these populations is much smaller. Now, I wanna talk about how this creates incentives actively for exploitation. Beyond the coercion factor and the power asymmetries that exist in incarcerated landscapes, I also want to talk about how this is going to um, make it so that in the future you decrease incentives to treat these populations. As Lewis tells you, you need these individuals to be exposed to the vaccine for trials to be effective at all, which means that researchers have an incentive to preserve an environment of high infection rates for the trials to proceed for, a, for a, a, like a period of three or six months. What this means is, First of all, not many um, 
inmates would actually be able to get these vaccines because you need to have the vast majority of people who are still in conditions where there is very high infection rates. This context crucially means that, first of all, not um, it mitigates the argument to a great extent because even if many people want to opt into these trials, it is simply impossible for them to get it by the virtue of the conditions uh, that need to happen for vaccine trials to occur. But more importantly, when more vaccines become available, now you have incentives for researchers to actively deny vaccines to these individuals within these incarcerated uh, environments because they want to continue the trials they have put in so much money, they have put in so much investment in, which means that in the future, if more vaccines become available, but you're still in a stage three for, uh, for these certain test sites, more people die and more people's autonomy is harmed. Lastly, I want to talk about how this creates really a bad political precedence. Because if it is the case that we open up this Pandora's box and say it is fine for incarcerated individuals to opt into vaccine trials now, you also make it a norm politically for people to say things like, well, if that is okay, why wouldn't it be okay for us to test riskier operations on them in the future, maybe phase two trials or even phase one trials, given that we can allow these people to opt in. This may makes it so that you have more and more dangerous options becoming politically viable in the future, which infringes on people's rights and autonomy even, even further. In sum, we think that, more, uh, first of all, people are unable to consent, but more importantly, this creates incentives for future harms. All right, here, here, the House thanks the member of opposition and recalls the leader of opposition, Louis Conway, uh, to deliver the final opposition speech, summarizing uh, their case, uh, not to exceed one minute. As someone who spent eight years in prison, I, I would have willingly done anything to get out of my cell for an hour or two, even if it meant putting my life at risk. And imagine, if you will, putting your health on the line for the greater good of the world outside of prison. Imagine being willing to leave your children without a father or a mother because you wanted to participate in a vaccine trial but you're not first in line to receive the very vaccine that you were tested for. Um, you know, what happens because politicians and special interest groups who are already lobbying against folks in prison and jails and detention centers receiving the vaccine decide that those very folks who were used as guinea pigs are no longer worthy to even be in line. You see, it's rife with opportunity of exploitation, rife with opportunities of corruption. Uh, you know, drugs are brought into prisons. Uh, diseases are brought into prisons. They're not endemic. And to say that these folks are the ones that we should be testing because they have been exposed to a disease based upon their current conviction status why we say that is not only unethical, it is unconscionable. You're here. The House thanks the Leader of Opposition and recalls the Prime Minister, Kamala Broderick, to deliver the final speech of the round, not to exceed two minutes. So prisoners are already at an increased risk to catch a contagious virus. That is now they aren't prioritized with immunizations and health and sanitary conditions. They're not up to acceptable standards. By participating in clinical trials, not only will prisoners gain access to a potentially effective vaccine earlier, they'll gain better sanitary and medical conditions in the long run. And by participating in a cl clinical research study, they'll be prioritized for immunization, and we will be providing it to a much need, we will be providing much needed care to an at-risk population. So ethical concerns are important and can't be overlooked. And a trial like this would have to be highly monitored and reviewed. This is a phase three trial. It isn't an issue of safety. It's an issue of efficacy. The opposition says that consent can't be achieved because incarcerated ind individuals will just bow down and submit to the authority of a medical professional. But Milgram's shock experiment worked the exact same way on ordinary individuals. And I don't understand why prisoners would suddenly be more susceptible to the coercion of authority when in ordinary individuals on the outside were just as susceptible. And testing on prisoners becoming more and more dangerous, all of these experiments that they listed happened before the 1970s. They existed before review boards and they would never be able to happen now. In fact, the Zimbardo prison experiment happened at Stanford. 
something like that would never be able to happen now because of review boards. We can't just say that something like this will happen again when we have procedures put in place to stop that. The government's proposition is an improvement on prisoner living conditions, while the opposition merely maintains the status quo. It just doesn't make anything better. And for those reasons, you should really support the government's proposition. Thank you. All right. Um, well, thank you, uh, all our debaters, for, for a really great round. Um, so now we're going to have our judges uh, exit for, for a bit, um, for just about 10 or 15 minutes or so. Um, and they're going to, to speak amongst themselves to confer. And while they do that, uh, we're gonna have our four debaters on a panel um, answering uh, questions from the audience. And so to do that, you can um, plug them into the Q&A function. Um, I have a few list, uh, questions my, myself that I can ask while we're waiting to, to hear from the audience, um, but then I'll ask the, the questions there. And um, so, um, so yeah, so, so definitely add the, the questions in the Q&A. We can give our judges just a minute to, um, to, to go off in their own panel once they've, they've finished complimenting the, uh, the debaters um, and, then, and then get our panel started. And I'll also just mention, um, so, so, this, so the panel, um, the, the debaters aren't, uh, you know, they, they chose their, their, their sides in the debate were kind of artificial. They're, they're not still on the same sides for the panel. They're just answering as themselves and, and giving thoughts that might conflict with their thoughts during the, um, uh, the round. Um, Okay. Uh, um, all right. So if people want to submit questions to the Q&A, um, the first question I'll ask um, is for the people who've been incarcerated. Um, so what is medical care like um, in prisons? So I, I really wanted op uh, for, for a lot of reasons for this. But like medical care is very difficult. Um, I tell the story of one time I, I sat in a waiting room for 24 hours to see a doctor and I saw a doctor and they just told me there's nothing we can do for you. And they just sent me back and that was it. They'll just hand you a pill and be like, here, take this. Well, what is it? Do you want it or not? Take it. And that's it. Uh, it's impossible. If you want an, if you want to get to the doctor, you have to get a corrections officer to take you. If they want to take you. They have to go either on their break, when their shift's over, when they're switching shifts, or maybe someone will kindly take you if they want to. But basically, it's up to if they want to, unless there's like an active medical emergency. And most of them don't really kindly want to take you. You know, so basically if you can get there and then you'll spend just hours waiting and waiting because there's no triage, there's no priority. You'll just sit there. Anyway. What are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I know for me, um, I always thought the doctor had a very flavorful mouthwash. Uh, I, I didn't realize he was showing up to work drunk, right? And, you know, I think what's important is that, you know, the folks who are able to work in prisons are not able to work in civilian hospitals or they have been suspended, um, you know, and it wasn't until I got out of prison and into advocacy and I began to do research on how they hire those doctors and they're specifically targeting folks that can't work anyplace else. Because no one else, what doctor will, will choose to work on a prison salary um, as opposed to being, um, you know, a, a doctor in New York City or uh, who would choose to be a doctor on the island if that's not the only place they could work. So I think looking further upstream to access to quality health care um, is I can't even imagine the administrative process if it was a two dose. Um, you know, once the the quarantine process, the, the administration process, the, the the cooling process, keeping them cold, um, even if they're not the the ones that 
don't have to be kept cold. Just the whole administration, administering of the shots would be something of a nightmare. Uh, the last thing I want to say, because I spent time in the psychiatric part, is that they only have like a small list of medications that they can give people. And doctors are really limited by what they can give. And they only have like one or two medicines for like schizophrenia that they can actually prescribe people. So they're really limited by that. And a lot of other medicines are considered contraband or they're not allowed to give out. I know this is really about uh, vaccines, but there is a problem with just overall medical access and especially prescription medication for people that are mentally ill. And um, so Noah Smith uh, asks a question, um, who is going to define the pandemic? Um, so um, uh, what do people think, you know, if, if how, how would a pandemic be defined and whose job would it be to define that in this, um, for, for this, these types of cases, um, do the panelists, uh, the panelists think? Um, I think I, I'm, I'm, trying to remember what exactly happened for COVID when it was um, first decided that it was a global pandemic. Um, I think that there are some quote unquote objective criteria that the WHO uses, um, like extent of transmissibility or the number of people that have been infected, those sorts of things. So if, if we are using like the strict legal definition of a pandemic, I, I suppose it would be um, the sorts of institutions that decide. Um, but more generally, I think the spirit of it is that um, it should be widespread, pose some relatively severe risk to human health, um, and, you know, has, has the potential to, oh, I'm sorry, that is, that is my kitty. Um, cat! <laughs> has has some potential uh, to to spread, you know, internationally is my understanding. So another question I have um, is, um, what's the connection? You know, so if you think about issues of um, vaccine hesitancy um, around the vaccine for for COVID. You know, how do you expect those to kind of play out um, in jails and prisons? And so I guess I have a sort of three-part question or people can kind of pick whichever one they want to um, cover. How do you expect it to play out in jails and prisons? Um, what are ways to help avoid vaccine, to, to help engender vaccine confidence in jails and prisons? And um, what role does this debate around medical testing have um, for the, these questions of, um, you know, are people going to be willing to, to take a vaccine? So I think I'll, I'll address the hesitancy part. You know, I, I think even in a free world and, and black communities, there is a resistance to vaccines just because of the historical use. And, and it's not just the Tuskegee experiment. It goes all the way back to slaves being used. Um, you know, and, 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 and us not even being considered humans. So I think that as we have seen the various ways that the government has infiltrated our communities, um, I, I think there's a, a real fear in people that, you know, it's not just a vaccine that they're injecting into folks, right? And part two, I think, is the social media aspect of it. There's so much fear mongering that's um, in play now, and it can it's it's global. Like you're able to to spread a rumor, or to spread misinformation or alternative facts, uh, you know, much quicker than it was in the 1800s or in, in the 1700s where information traveled much slower. So I, I think it's the, it's the speed of transmission of information which encourages hesitancy and communities that are most impacted by COVID 
and by uh, these type of um, endemic viruses and diseases, even pre-COVID. You're on mute or you're... We have another question um, from Ezra uh, who asks, do you think that relatively extreme actions like this taken during times of crisis create precedent for less dangerous situations? I guess I could speak to it a little bit since I guess I was already not trying to um, so I do think it is, I mean, at least from my you know, college, again, college students' perspective, you know, not an expert, but it could definitely set a precedent. Um, probably has happened for a lot of other policies historically, but I guess it is always difficult to say, um, making a general case, because governments creating precedents and taking certain policies and extending them to other things are also very much context dependent. And so I guess like the short answer is it's definitely I I feel like possible from you know the readings I've done, but again um, probably very context dependent. Um, and so um, Zachariah has a question: What would you say is the difference between testing on incarcerated people and testing on poor communities? Um, I ask this because both groups are in a way underprivileged one has the freedom to like get up and leave uh testing on prisoners is against the nuremberg code i, I would say and it's specifically tests testing on people who aren't allowed to leave their environment so even though you are poor and may be targeted by it's predatory you know you're taking it and maybe coerced by the money you still can actively turn it down. You can leave if you don't enjoy being in that environment anymore. You don't want to actively participate in studying. And perhaps more granularly, you know, healthcare, health statuses in prison decline while you're in there. Your healthcare deteriorates. Um, and so while in the free world, you're able to, yes, some folks live in food deserts. Yes, some folks don't have access. But in prison, it, the, the studies have shown that folks go into prison much healthier than they come out of prison. And so when you couple that with this type of effort, then you are compounding not only pre-existing uh, conditions, but you're compounding the conditions that are being exerted on the individual body environment, which is much more exasperated than you would say in a poverty stricken condition. Because even if I'm in the projects, there's a hospital across the street. At least in Brooklyn. What? Um... Uh, let me ask the, the question of um, how can medical care in prisons be improved, or what's the what's the path to the the future? You know, how how can we um, help ameliorate some of these these problems and injustices that the people have talked about? God, I hate to be the one that's talking. Somebody shut me up, but. So I listened. So Bill Gates, what Bill Gates did was he he dumped 750 million into the World Health Organization, which basically he he realized that you know drug manufacturers are not going to invest in vaccines because vaccines don't make money. So he figured out a way to look at the issue worldwide and solve a worldwide issue that helped local American companies make money, even though he was subsidizing that. So what that means is improving healthcare in prison means we're gonna have to subsidize a set of doctors that are, that are above and beyond the qualifications that are currently sought out by healthcare staff. 
That means we're going to have to look to people like Bill Gates to pay the salaries of, of folks so that they can be incentivized to work in these areas, right? And we're also going to have to invest in the same type of technology that we invest in hospitals outside, right? And that means that, you know, possibly we're going to have to get um, folks out of prison. Right? I think that's the best health care for folks in prison is to get folks out of prison. I think decarceration is the best vaccination. But if we're going to subject people to inhuman conditions, the very least we can do is make sure they have access to stellar health care. One question. Um, um, so one question I have um, uh, that's maybe a bit more complicated or requires maybe a bit more creativity. Um, you know, when you think of it as, as debaters, um, when you think of other cases you've debated, um, what cases, uh, if, you know, seem kind of most similar to, to this one or what, what is, you know, what, what remind, what does this remind you of or, or what are issues um, that you think have a kind of similar uh, structure um, or, or raise analogous issues um, to this to this case. I'm thinking of a lot of other cases that involve a particularly vulnerable population um, and whether or not to give them certain benefits that are sort of taken for granted by the rest of the population um, in in exchange for uh, obvious risks. Um, I think this is a somewhat outdated debate topic, at least in the circuit these days, but um, topics such as legalizing surrogate motherhood, um, that that was mostly the one that came to mind, um, or, or even the concept of like allowing financial compensation for clinical trials um, for the same reasons of coercion um, for those in poverty. So a, a lot of those cases that involve like a, a very evident trade-off, but where the benefit is something that you might be willing to risk everything for. Um, I, I'm also thinking of the, the case of um, whether we should allow terminally ill patients to access um, treatments that haven't been tested for safety. Other thoughts on analogous issues? Yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, so I guess I don't have another example, but um, it's also really interesting to kind of tease out, even though these cases might be analogous, like where are they different and what is so unique about this particular situation? Um, so I guess like the, you know, surrogate motherhood, there's, you know, the classic argument in, if you've debated, you probably have run this, you know, stock, but the black market, you know, is gonna, <laughs> there's gonna be like a black market and we better legalize it. And so I think in this case, um, I, the idea of that argument not being applicable here does point to, I think, a particular poignant part about this, which is that people don't have the freedom to leave and they don't have the freedom to, you know, act otherwise or to break the law or, you know, to do other things. And I think this is why, for me, at least, this case is very, very interesting and very poignant and very unique. Uh, Lewis and Camilla, any thoughts on, on similar cases you debated in the past? Um, I was thinking the challenge trial debate. And uh, for some reason, I, I thought of the whether we should compensate kidney donor debate, but I'm not uh, flushing out the connection right now. Fair enough. All right, um, so I think we have um, all, so, so thanks for a uh, good panel and good, good um, answers to the questions. Uh, and thanks to our audience members for, for asking some good questions. Um, so I think we have, uh, I think all of our judges back. Um, and so what we're going to do is we'll have our judges give um, their reason for decision in reverse order to uh, how we introduce them. So we introduced alphabetically, and so we'll go um, backwards out alphabetically. And basically, just each of the judges, um, you're just offering, you know, some of your thoughts on the round and which side you voted for. Um, the team arguing in favor of um, people in of doing vaccine studies uh, in prisons during pandemics. Uh, which is the government or team arguing against the opposition, will count up the votes at the end and uh, declare a winner and then wrap up. Um, and so with that, um, I will uh, put um, uh, Holly Taylor on the, the spot 
and have her um, go first and giving her her thoughts about the. Um... Thanks, Josh. So first of all, it was really terrific uh, to be involved in this um, debate or be <laughs> a, a judge in the debate. I appreciated the uh, arguments on both sides, uh, both creative and interesting. Um, I have to uh, go with the government um, in this case. I felt like they had a core argument that they uh, articulated well. And I found that the opposition didn't have a similarly core argument that um, helped me understand what their core concerns were and or the core from which their argument came. Um, I, the thing that I left the um, debate with was, I think the last thing that Camilla mentioned or the most one of the more persuasive things was when she said that not taking this action would be to accept the status quo, which I thought was uh, a, a lovely way to summarize what they were discussing. Um, I also very much appreciated the personal anecdotes that were shared. And I think that was a persuasive um, form of argument, but I didn't find um, those in the end to uh, win the day. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, Jenny Savage. What a fantastic debate. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to listen to some of the you know best and brightest minds in the country. Really, really appreciate that. Um, I also sided with the government and it was interesting to me because it came down to sort of what deontological, deontological side constraints do we accept on the way to utility if that's the way that we're looking at it. Um, I coach, I don't coach parliamentary debate. It's one of the few things that I don't coach, but I think that the round could have been um, cleared up a little bit if, if e both sides had thought about what they wanted us as judges to aim at. Is the primary value autonomy? Is it consequentialism, you know, and, and, um, and like for the good of society, is it basically a body count at the end of the day or is autonomy more important? So um, with that said, I want to um, tell each of you something that was so critically imp important and impressive about what you did. Camila, your use of evidence, both the Marshall card and your AC, and then also um, referencing the Milgram and Zimbardo studies gave you such an air of authority and wonderful nerdiness that I just loved, right? I believe everything you have to say. And Lewis, when you um, sort of opened your kimono at the end of the NC, or sorry, at the end of the NR, and you spoke with personal authority about your own story, that's what we discussed in the judge's room. We were wrapped with that. That gave you personal authority and made us really believe you and hesitate in voting for the government, I have to say. So thank you for sharing that. And please carry both of those practices into your regular lives when you advocate for the necessary reforms. Uh, great, um, uh, Rob Reach. So um, I, unlike my two previous colleagues sided with the opposition, um, I thought to give a take on the way Jenny just framed this, that um, Camilla Strasla framed this debate for us as chiefly about respect for persons and therefore about autonomy, and that the early parts of the debate revolved around that initial frame and orientation. And what I understood the implications of the government's case to be was that because of respect for persons, it's not merely permissible to treat um, incarcerated peoples in phase three trials, but we are obligated to include them lest we paternalize and disrespect them. And since I didn't hear any limiting, limiting um, principle for why that would be the case and plenty of reasons to think why we might not include um, our prisoners in, in the phase three trials, at the end, uh, I came out thinking that the opposition had, had won the balance of the debate. Great, uh, Christopher Lewis. So 
Uh, thank you all for this really uh, interesting debate. Um, I'm still unsure exactly how I feel about these issues. As someone with a background in philosophy, these are the kinds of tough moral issues that I would like to dig into for much longer than this. So it's it's really hard for me to come into a setting like this and have to render a verdict right away. Um, that being said, uh, I think the way that I'm looking at this is they're kind of two uh, non-consequentialist arguments. What in, in the government's argument has to do with uh, paternalizing, the worry about paternalizing, and the opposition's argument has to do with the worry about um, genuine consent. Um, and I, I sort of felt like they canceled each other out. Um, I didn't know exactly how to balance those, but I felt like they, oh, those were both good arguments. Um, the more utilitarian arguments about the effects, I felt like it was just an easier proposition for the government to defend, given how narrowly the proposition was framed. It's about stage three trials. Um, and I think, um, I think that uh, Enchia did a good job uh, countering the kind of safety benefits uh, by talking about possible perverse incentives and bad precedent that could be set. Um, but I think that was just a difficult argument to make empirically. And it, it looked like, um, it looked like the, the balance of utility would tell in favor of the government's uh, side. So that's where, that's where I ended up. Okay. Um, so uh, you voted for government? No, I understood right. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Gosh, I think you're muted. Sorry, Lily? Um, I, similar to Chris, I, I still feel very torn, um, to be completely honest. And I think there's, there's two reasons. One is that this was a very abbreviated round. And I think that, to me, I was left with a lot of questions about both the empirical circumstances that we were talking about within prison. So what were the conditions for prisoners, um, both in terms of access to follow-up treatment and I felt that that uh, a longer time in the round might have cleaned some of those questions up, um, as well as um, the, and I thought this was a really interesting point raised later in the round, about um, specifically whether or not prison populations are a unique population. I felt like part of the government's case hinged specifically on an argument that there were extrapolable claims about the prison population, so there it's crowded, um, high, high rates of transmission, but also, I mean, horrifically, so many people in the United States live in prison, period. Um, way too many, in my opinion. And so um, I, I couldn't put that as an argument to some extent for the government because that wasn't made explicitly in the round, but I was left thinking about that question from the government's case, which is, um, do we have an obligation specifically to test the effects of vaccines on a population that is much too high? actually, and is its own unique population. So it's not just the sort of reasons around respect for persons or the reasons that this is like high poverty populations elsewhere, but that actually prisons are their own unique population. Um, so I, I will just say those, those weren't really covered, but they were, um, I think similar to Chris's point, things I really wanna keep thinking about. Um, I think I left similar to others, um, feeling that the balance of the round tipped slightly towards the government side, um, only sort of the things that were not left said, much less than the sort of specifics of the claims that were made. Um, I agree with Rob that there was this really interesting point um, that the, the government, I think it, at first it seemed to me was hinging their case around, though I interpreted it a little bit differently than Rob, which is around the fact that we have to have respect for persons as we would any other persons under certain conditions. Um, I didn't feel that coming across as strongly from the government case um, as stated and felt that it was more that um, there are reasonable um, conditions for consent in prison con uh, specifically for these kinds of phase three vaccinations and that there were enough regulations in place post seventies to compensate for that. But that's actually still an empirical question that left hanging. And I think that the opposition left some um, challenge on the table for me um, in, in actually saying here are the specifics of what's going on and here's what people would or would not have access to. So I think that had there been a bit more rebuttal on that side from the opposition, 
Um, it felt a little bit sometimes like two ships passing in the night here. Um, so that the proposition case had a strong case and the opposition case had a strong case that wasn't quite set up to rebut the case that the government team put on the table. Um, so I think the opposition case as it was presented was extraordinarily strong for a lot of the reasons that people uh, mentioned, both from the, um, the way it was constructed and presented empirically, as well as the, um, the, the context and the nuance presented in terms of the lived experience of being incarcerated, I thought really sent it home and left this uh, honestly something I will be thinking about for the days to come. So thank you all. Uh, Kate? Hey, so yeah, like everyone else, I thought this was a really great debate. I really liked the combination of like the evidence and people's personal experience. I thought that was a cool um, aspect of this, how that came together. Um, I too thought the government won. Um, I guess for me, you know, I, I was really surprised when Camilla mentioned really early in her speech that like 98% of prisoners think they should be allowed to participate in these kinds of trials. That's a really high number. And I think kind of all else equal, my default perspective was that we should honor their preferences and, and defer to what they're telling us about what they what they want, uh, especially in an environment where I think that in, inmates often aren't given uh, as much control over their lives or allowed to like kind of like have those opinions. And so by default, I would credit that. I, I think the most persuasive thing to me on the opposition was to undercut that by saying that 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 isn't real, it's coerced, you know, that that consent is not, it's in a non-free environment because perhaps guards are forcing them into it or or just the sheer boredom of prison, the desire to get out of your cell is kind of forcing you into it. Uh, I find that somewhat persuasive, but I thought the government did a good job of responding to those concerns that, um, you know, although I absolutely believe that guards will engage in abuse and retaliation of inmates if they have a reason to, they perhaps don't have much of an incentive to try to force people into um, clinical trials. There's really nothing in it for them. Um, and there are sort of the protections of the IRB. And so with those responses, I think that kind of undercuts some of the concerns about coercion. And um, I thought Camilla did a good job in the final speech of bringing it home that sort of the alternative is that these people are in bad situations where they don't have the health care they need. And this is sort of marginally better to give them this one thing and, and something that they say that they want. Um, so all, you know, at least marginally, I think it's probably based on what people were arguing in the debate, better to let them participate if they choose to do so, or to take that choice as real. All right, um, and Harry is the, the final judge, go ahead. Last, last and I, I, guess, I guess least at this point, given the way the votes are going, but, uh, uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, I wanna echo what everyone else has said, and I won't take up too much of your time because uh, there have been a few of these now, um, but I thoroughly enjoyed the debate. It's obviously a very compressed timeline and there's relatively limited option, opportunities for people to kind of you know, engage across from one another. Um, and, and, and so, you know, given those constraints, I thought you guys all did an extraordinary job or even without those constraints. So thank you very much. It was a, you know, really thought provoking topic and, um, you know, raised a, raised a ton of issues that, that to be honest, I don't think about day to day. Um, so very much appreciate that. Um, so for reasons that are quite, that are sort of similar to those that others have, have described before, I ended up in a difficult decision, um, voting for the government. And the reason from my perspective is, um, the government essentially, I think opposition gave a, you know, an extremely powerful and rhetorically quite beautiful um, rebuttal to a, a sort of like a like an outline of a, of a case that the government could have made but didn't really make. And, and for me, there were kind of two hinge points that sort of that sort of touched everything else. The first is the framing about, you know, kind of phase three trials, which whether true or not, and I think it'd be perfectly fine for opposition to, to contest it, wasn't really contested enough for me to believe that the harms of these things, of these trials were likely to be significant or, you know, very, you know, material, like very, really significant compared to the very obvious problems the proposition described of lots of people um, in, in these circumstances, you know, uh, catching or dying of, of COVID, but also, um, you know, the, 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 a lot of the consent arguments to me, for various reasons that, that we could go into offline, don't hinge so much on, you know, sort of philosophical notions, but rather the notion that people, that, that the choice carries with it some small possibility of very bad outcomes. And the fact that the downside outcome seems, you know, not so much life threatening as maybe you get, you know, very, you get sick, just, just changes the game in terms of the weighing and thinking about those principles for me. Um, 
and 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 it also you know weakens a lot of the the arguments about the harms to to prisoners from taking it and the model and the setup from government you know quite well uh, caveats out a lot of the kind of what ifs that we get from from opposition about people exchanging you know the right to the right to take these vaccines for commissary money or other things and so i, I think that unfortunately blunts a lot of the force that was coming out of the gate on the opposition side in a way that isn't really responded to and if anything is kind of buttressed by the government when they say actually even if there is room on the margins for people to fiddle with the rules it's just not clear that guards have a particular incentive to do so here like there's no reason why guards are going to would, would want to force these people to take phase three vaccines rather than people outside of the prison to take phase back three vaccines it's not really clear there's anything in it for them and so then for me i think it it, it boils down to the issue of the issue of choice, which I think is pretty clear and, and sort of thrashed out by statistics, but also the issue of what makes the prison environment better, first order in terms of fewer people dying of this disease and having a chance to protect themselves, but second order in terms of the circumstances that are set up around them. And long story short, I found it, I think some of the cases from opposition could have been developed into good arguments about what happens to that environment in the presence of these vaccines, but I just didn't see a plausible enough path um, to be able to give them to be able to give them kind of precedence over a fairly clear mechanism established by by the government. So that's how I ended up voting how I voted. All right, great. Well, thank you so much um, for all of our participants in tonight's debate um, and to the, the debaters and the judges and also um, to, to the audience. Um, and um, on a 6-1 decision, uh, the government team won tonight. So congratulations to the government team. Um, and, uh, uh, and yeah, and so we hope that you'll come to future Rikers debate events. Uh, and thank you, everyone, and hope everyone has a great rest of the evening.